Well, Disney's subscriber number, I think, blew most people away. It was an yeah. excellent number, but um, there was a high expectation coming in. And, um, you know, in the very near term, there are certainly cost issues. You knew about that. And despite such a strong subscriber number, um, you know, Disney was not willing to be drawn on the question of will they upgrade their forecast. I mean, they are almost halfway to the lower end of their target in five years' time. <laughs> but the reason I think the stock is down today probably is that um, there are heavy costs in front of us still. We've got some di difficult comparisons in the studio division, also in the parks division, uh, particularly in China, of course. That's going to lead to a 20 percent drop and operating income the next quarter um, and the ongoing investment costs of, of all these things. So there, there is still a lot to, to balance on this one and the expectation was high coming in. Jessica, is that your take as well that it's the costs here despite this uh, dramatic performance of Disney Plus in the early days that has investors concerned? And if, if you're an investor who's not as concerned about that because Bob Iger has done pretty well uh, at his investments, one might argue in the past, uh, is this an opportunity for you? Um, yeah, our take is a little bit different. Um, our view is that the stock is weak today uh, because of the outlook, basically for media networks for the pay TV universe. So the sub loss was 2% reported, but really 4.5% if you adjust for the ACC network. And so there is concern that there is a, a model that's in transition. Having said that, Disney surprised on the upside in many areas on their direct to consumer, consumer platforms, plural. Disney Plus, where the subs were, 28.6 million is basically the upper end of their domestic sub target in five years. Most of those subs are domestic. Hulu had some nice growth, but ESPN Plus really surprised. Our view is that, that investors are actually looking through most of these costs, and there's just a concern about the long-term pay TV bundle. And we believe that plan B for Disney is to have ESPN Plus in place and ready to go. Tim, Another I big go surprise back. I would just point out is, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jessica. I was going to say another really big positive, another big positive surprise is the speed of the international rollout. So Disney pre-announced that they were going to go into Western Europe a week earlier than originally planned. But the big news last night is how quickly they're going into India. And they have a huge advantage there because they own Star, which is the dominant media company in that country, and Hotstar is their direct-to-consumer platform. They will rebrand to Disney Plus Hotstar, and it's, it's such a huge advantage having that platform in place with such a dominant media market position. Um, and it starts at the exact same time that the cricket, IPL, the Cricket League starts, which is another, that, that is the biggest sport in India. So I guess the bottom line to us is that traditional media companies, Disney in particular, have huge advantages in their branded IP, their marketing platforms, their libraries, and yeah. also the, the fact that they produce so much for existing networks. It does raise an interesting point about international, and we've seen this through the Netflix prism, about whether or not investors will value international growth the way they value domestic growth. Can that, does that story repeat or echo at Disney? Tim? Well, Netflix had a great advantage for a few years with the international growth, and I think still, they still have a, a long way to go on that, and that will serve them well. It's such early days for Disney now, um, and I think it's maybe a little too early to predict from our side what the growth will be per country, per region. I mean, in this country, in the U.S., we all know Disney so well, and of course the brand is well, well known globally, but how much will people subscribe to this service in other countries? What will the growth rate be? It's just too early to say on that. I mean, look, we're bullish. We think they will have to raise their 60 to 90 million global target quite soon, actually. They'll, they'll get very close to that from very to soon. What? 60 to 90 to now... I could be double that in five really? years eventually. I mean, look, look, if they're if they're at 28 already in I three months. I said this this morning, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think there's there's a long way to go. But, I, I, you know, we don't have a forecast for international subs looking out. That's the next batch of work to do. But it's, it's hard to predict at this point. All right. Here's my here's here's the overarching theme I'm hearing from both of you in this conversation right now. And that is that at least near term, we're talking about models in transition. It begs the question, Jessica, you've got a buy rating price target 168. What is the incentive for investors to buy yeah. in here versus wait a little bit longer? I mean, Disney has beat all expectations on their direct to consumer initiative, which is their key priority at the moment. So the next big catalyst will be uh, Western Europe at the end of March, and then, of course, India at, at late March, right, a week after that, um, to be followed by other regions. In the meantime, their underlying business is 
are, are relatively the underlying business. Yes, there is China and um, the impact that we'll see in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Um, but but the underlying numbers, you, you could see at Walt Disney World and Disneyland, having opened Star Wars Land, their, their bookings really very strong. They're double digit. So, so their businesses, again, you know, I think are unique and running well.